It's really special for me to be here today. Most of the conferences I go to, we speak about the brain, we, we have a good time, some of us are even fun, as we've heard, but we very, very seldom change anything in this world. Whereas here today, I have the feeling that I'm surrounded by people that actually do make this a better world. So it's really special for me to be here today. Now, the big question that interests me in my lab is what makes us empathic? And if you have a look at this picture of a Syrian refugee, I think it really captures this experience that we have. We look at him, but if you're anything like I am, if you look in his eyes, at his gaping mouth, at the tears in his face, you cannot help but not just understand what he goes through, but be affected by what he goes through. You feel his pain, you feel his despair. And if you look at his grimacing mouth, for instance, you can't help but almost feel a knot forming in your own. And this is really the mystery that we're interested in in our lab. Why is it that what other people go through is not just something that we perceive or understand, but something that really gets inside of us and affects us in deep ways. Now, our work really started not by looking at how humans perceive what goes on in others, but by studying what happens in monkeys. And the main reason for that is that in monkeys, we have the technology to really interrogate what individual neurons do in the brain, while you can freely interact with the monkey. And that really gives us this unique ability to really understand what the individual soldiers in our brain, the neurons, really do when we perceive what goes on in others. And so in the early studies, what we did was we studied what this blue region here, which is the premotor cortex, was doing. Now, at the time, people were assuming that that part of the brain was only there to control the monkey's own action. It's, in a way, the motor system. It allows the monkey to behave in the world. And if we record from neurons in that region, the first thing we'll find is that most neurons will become active just before the monkey does something. So one specific neuron might be involved whenever the monkey grasps an object. Another neuron might be involved whenever the monkey breaks something. And if you stimulate these neurons, you'll see that the monkey will start doing these actions. So it's really part of what makes the monkey move himself. The surprise came from the fact that we observed that about 10% of these neurons that should only control the monkey's own actions were also active while the monkey wasn't doing anything, but we were standing in front of the monkey and performing these acts. So if here you're listening to a neuron that's active when the monkey is grasping, you would see that the same neuron would respond when you grasp something with your hand or with your mouth. And what I'm going to do now is give you an impression for, for what happens really in the lab. So you're going to hear in the audio track the firing pattern of the neuron. First, while the monkey is grasping, so that's the motor discharge that was well documented. But then as well, while the monkey observes me perform similar actions. So here the monkey was grasping. Now the monkey sees me grasp with my mouth and here with my hand again. And here with the hand again. Now this was a complete surprise. Now the reason for that is that these neurons were supposed to only control the monkey's own action. So why is it that the same neurons start responding while the monkey isn't doing anything but seeing me do that? And in a way, what these neurons were showing us was that part of what happens while you perceive others is not just visual processing, but you actually use your own body as a mirror for what other people do. And by mapping what someone else does onto how you would do it yourself, you, of course, get access to all the richness of your own experiences. So if you see me, for instance, take this glass and drink from it, Mm. Mm. and enjoy it. 
you can now just, uh, in addition to seeing me doing it, you can almost feel the sensation of water in your mouth and the refreshment. And this is what this embodied condition, uh, embodied cognition, which is really mapping onto your own motor system, could give you. Now, most of you, of course, are not really interested in monkeys, so the question is, do humans have a similar system? Now, in humans, you don't typically get the opportunity to record from single neurons, but what we can do is we can put people in an MRI scanner and ask them to perform certain actions, like um, scooping soup out of a ball. By doing that, we can map all the brain regions that are involved in performing that action. And you see them here in red. So in the, there, the, in the, the premotor regions we were looking at in the monkey, primary motor regions that directly control your body, and somatosensory regions that map what touch feels in your body. Now, the interesting thing is after you've mapped that person's motor system, you can show him movies of other people performing similar actions. You can again measure what parts of the brain become active, and there would be these blue regions here. And what you observe is that there's overlap between the two. So much like the monkey, you reactivate part of your own motor system as if you'd be drinking yourself from that glass. Now, the interesting thing is that the brain regions that become uh, active here and here in both conditions are the same ones in which we recorded from in the monkey and found these mirror neurons. So in a way, just like the monkey, we seem to recruit our own actions whenever we perceive those of others. Now, of course, when you think about empathy, you don't first think about mapping the actions of others. You think more about sensations and emotions. And so I remember, I work together with my wife, so we often have very heated discussions. And this one evening, she was cutting onions while I was uh, discussing a problem we had with a postdoc in the lab. And she became so absorbed in the thought that at some point I saw the knife stop cutting into the onion and start to cut into her finger with a little bit of blood coming out of the cut. And what really struck me at that moment was the fact that I was really having to shake my own finger just because I was so contagious by her pain. So we were really interested in seeing whether what we had seen in the motor system was true for sensations as well. So we put people in the scanner, but we decided not to cut their finger off because, <laughs> because then we could only get 10 trials and we need more than that for our experiment. So instead we put them in the scanner and we brushed their legs with a washing glove. Now, if you do that a couple of times, one leg, then the other, you can map the parts of the brain that are responsible for feeling touch on your own body. And here in red, you see the secondary somatosensory uh, brain region, which is a core brain region for this sense of being touched on your own body. Then we showed the, the people as well, movies of other people getting touched. Now, they're not the most exciting movies you've ever seen. <laughs> But they were enough to recruit activity in the brain of the observer. And to our surprise, the brain region that was most strongly activated by the sight of touch in others was the same brain region that was involved in feeling touch on your own body. So again, while you perceive what goes on in others, you don't just see or think about it, but you embody it, you map it onto your own body. And that gives you this rich sensation of what it really feels like to be touched. Now, the obvious thing that we think about when we think about uh, empathy, of course, is really emotions. Now, emotions are very difficult to study in a lab because I can put you in a scanner and ask you to, to drink from a glass, and you can do that as often as I want. It's very simple. But if I put you in the scanner and I ask you to be happy for me for 10 seconds, that's much harder to do, right? So we came up with one solution to uh, inducing strong emotion. There was to put people in the scanner with an anesthesia mask on their face. And they ask you, why do I get an anesthesia mask? But we just told them, uh, just like you did before, just wait a bit later, you're going to find out soon enough. <laughs> 
Now then what we do is we first start to puff pleasant smells like strawberry and mint uh, in there, and I figure this is not too bad. But then we switch to things like butyric acid or sulfur or marketan. Now, that worked pretty well. So we had to take two subjects out of the scanner because they started vomiting. But for the other ones, we could repeatedly induce a strong, very vivid emotion of disgust while measuring brain activity. And if you do that, one of the brain regions that you see in here, I've kind of symbolically opened the brain for you to see it, is the insula, which is a deeper brain region that's very much involved in sensing what goes on in your own body. And while you're experiencing these terrible smells, you activate this anterior part. And if you're electrostimulated, for instance, you would start to vomit. So it's really part of your own disgust. And then we showed people movies of other people going through similar emotions. And by now, you'll probably not be so surprised anymore. You actually activate your own insula as if you'd be smelling something bad simply by seeing someone else go through a disgusting experience. And this overlap, again, gives you now a kind of access to your own bodily sensation of an emotion while you simply see something else happening to the person. Now, if we map all of that back into the brain, what we see was that while we witness this Syrian boy, we really do not just activate visual representation of what this looks like, like a photo camera would. No, we actually map this onto our own motor cortex as if we'd be doing a similar action. We map this onto our own somatosensory cortex as if we'd be going through a similar sensation. And we'll activate our own emotions as if we'd be experiencing similar emotions. Now, if you take all of that into account, now while you're witnessing this boy, you no longer just see him, but your brain has put you into a similar state to the one that this child is in. And because of that, of course, you don't just see or understand what goes on in him. But you can really become that boy for a second. You can dive into his inner world and be strongly affected by it. Now, as a scientist, of course, I see that what I've just done is a lot of hand-waving. I've shown you some blobs in the brain that become active while you witness somebody else's state, and I've drawn very strong conclusions from that. One, that it really helps you to understand what goes on in him, and second, that it will, in a way, kind of give you a strong emotional state that may even motivate you to help him. Now, as a scientist, one of my roles is really to be critical of these assumptions and really try to test them. And so in the rest of the talk, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, discuss with you some experiments in which we've really tried to see whether altering that brain activity that I think is important to give us uh, insight really does influence how able we are to perceive what goes on in others. And we look at simple states, like how much effort someone is uh, delivering, and we look at things like emotional recognition. Then in the second part, I'll try to see whether that really changes how we feel and what we're willing to do. So we'll have a look at whether this really drives a certain form of emotional contagion, which is really feeling what the other person is feeling, and second, whether this will influence you to actually do something to help the other person. And finally, at the end, I'll discuss a bit the richness of regulations that we've seen in that system, which means factors that really will determine how much you'll activate your own state while you perceive those of others. Now, let's first think about whether this helps us perceive what goes on in others. So to do that, let's look a little bit in more detail at what becomes recruited while you, for instance, see someone perform an action. Uh, I've shown you a very broad map in the beginning, but now let's look in a bit more detail. So if I ask you to execute an action uh, in the scanner, I can map not just from a group of subjects, but I can map for each single one of you all the brain regions that become active. I can do the same while you individual perceive meaningful actions 
like uh, you know, taking a drink from a glass, and subtract from that uninteresting activity triggered just by seeing the object or by seeing a movement that doesn't have a purpose. If you do that, you would get for a single subject these blue areas. Then I can overlap the two, identify all the regions that are common to the two, and really see what brain regions they fall in. Now, two brain regions we've talked about already. One is the premotor cortex that programs your own actions. The other one is the parietal cortex that is also part of your motor system. But then there's two other brain regions I'd like to speak about in a little bit more detail. One is the somatosensory cortex, and the other one is the cerebellum. And before we really go into that, one of the questions we had is what would be situations where we feel that mapping what other people do onto our own body would give us insights that we don't have without that. And we figured, well, there's a very simple task. Look at me lift this bag. And I ask you to judge how heavy this bag is. So who thinks that this bag weighs about two kilos? You know what kilos are in Canada, right? <laughs> I have to apologize for the American people in the audience. That would be four pounds. Who think it weighs two kilos? Who think it weighs about 300 grams? Who thinks it weighs about 100 grams? OK, you're pretty good at this. How do you know how much this weighs? Could contain a couple of books and weigh about a kilo. But you're right, it doesn't. And somehow, by just watching me lift it, you get an intuition of how much effort I'm putting in and therefore how much it weighs. So what we try to do in an experiment is take a simple task like that and then interfere with brain activity in your somatosensory cortex. And if mapping my action onto yours is really critical, you should become less able to judge the weight of this bag if I interfere with your ability to map it onto your own body. So then what we do is basically we, know we have a slightly more controlled task in which people see someone lift a blue can. And in some trials, the blue can is light. In someone, it's filled with metal. And then what we do is we put a TMS uh, machine over people's somatosensory cortex. What that does is it will deliver a very short magnetic pulse. The magnetic pulse will be transformed in your neurons into a little bit of electricity that for that very moment will basically perturb your system a little bit. Then as soon as you stop the magnetic pulse, you're back where you were before. But while I'm applying it, I can see whether disturbing your ability to map this onto your own body will disturb your ability to judge the weight. And what we found was that that's the case. Your performance drops, not dramatically, but of course we didn't break that part of the brain. It's just a very subtle perturbation. Then we figured, well, how would it work if you just see two marbles bounce off a surface and I would ask you to judge the weight of these marbles? There's nothing you can empathize with here, but would your performance still decrease? And in that case, we found that there is no decrease in performance. So it's really specifically to empathize with other people that you need your own body, so to speak. And then we can move the TMS pulse to region that shouldn't have an effect, and they don't have an effect. We can move them to an, uh, to an other motor region that we think should have an effect. And we see again that it has an effect. Now what that allows us to do is really to go away from just showing you blobs and show you that if you perturb this form of empathy of mapping it onto yourself, you really lose parts of your intuition, for instance, of how much effort someone is putting in an action. Now, the cerebellum is a part of your motor brain that most people think is pretty stupid and only serves to make very skilled movements. So it's important when you learn the piano, but most people wouldn't think that it's important for your empathy. Now, we've uh, studied patients that have degeneration uh, of that part of your motor brain, 
And if you ask them, for instance, to lift an object uh, themselves, they're not as good as other people are judging how heavy this is. This is what you see in this graph, the performance is lower. But again, we saw that if you show them someone else lifting an object and ask them to judge how heavy that object is, the performance is also impaired. So again, this keeps documenting the fact that you need a skill to be able to understand and perceive a skill in others. Now, how about emotions? Your ability to judge what emotional state other people are in. Now, the problem here is that the stimulation technique we were using before with TMS can only reach parts of your brain that are superficial. Now, when we talk about the emotional experiences, a lot of them are located in deeper brain regions like the insula and the cingulate. And we cannot directly neuromodulate that in healthy volunteers. But what we can do is go to clinics where people are referred to because they have brain damage. And so, for instance, a colleague of mine, Ralph Adolf, and found this patient here that has a, a lesion in the insula because she had a herpes uh, simplex infection. And what she presented with in the clinic as her main symptom was the fact that she was not feeling disgust herself anymore. So you could give her something really unpleasant to drink, and she would just drink it and think that it's perfectly pleasant. But what he then observed was that if he shows that um, patient a photo of a happy person, an emotional state she still has, she can tell immediately, oh, the person is happy. If you show her a photo of a sad person, she can say, yeah, that person is sad. But when you showed her a picture of a disgusted person, she had no idea of what was going on in that subject. And unlike any of the controls, she would come up with the intuition that that person is sad, for instance, which is a state people normally don't confuse. And that really shows us that there is no area of the brain that's really devoted to empathy. What you have are brain regions that are specialized in specific states of the self. And if you lose that state of the self, you also lose your ability to intuitively feel that state in other people. Now, you can do a more systematic study with patients as well. So for instance, Ralph Adolf uh, had a look at the 108 patients that were admitted to clinics because they had cardiovascular accidents in their brain. So each of them has a lesion somewhere in the brain. Then what he did was he showed them all sorts of emotional facial expressions. He asked them to rate what was going on in that person. And he then split the patients into those that had problems in recognizing emotions and those that didn't have problems. And then he went back to the brain images he had and he looked at where a brain damage would predict poor abilities to recognize facial expressions. And he came up with all of these uh, red regions here, which involved the kind of emotional insula we had talked about, the somatosensory cortex that you use to feel sensations on your own body, and the premotor cortex that's involved in performing your own actions. Again, showing that we don't just activate these brain regions, but that if we can no longer activate them, we really lose this intuitive access to other people's inner lives. So I think now I've convinced you that the ability to map what goes on in others onto brain regions involved in your own states is really important for your ability to perceive what goes on in others. But now the next question is, does it really change how we feel? Will it make us catch the emotional states of others? And second, Will it actually motivate us to help other people? Which I think to a large degree is what really motivates roots of empathy. The notion that if we can increase empathy, we make better citizens that will work better in society. Now, we tried to test these two questions. One challenge really in looking at the degree to which these states really change your effective inner lives, like I was mentioning, is the fact that they happen deep in the brain. 
And therefore, we cannot get a good control of the neural mechanisms that make us catch the emotions of others in humans. Because of that, one of the big efforts in the lab has been to try to develop animal models of empathy. And that gives us two things. On the one hand, it gives us insights into whether this is really something specifically human, maybe a result of, of how we educate our children, or whether the ability to catch the emotions of others is something that's much deeper rooted in our biology, something we may maybe share with rats and rodents and, and other mammals. Now, before we switch to animals, we have, of course, to think a little bit about what we mean with empathy. And we in the lab kind of uh, conceive of empathy as being a tree of phenomena. And uh, of course, I'm struck by how similar that symbolism is to the one of roots of empathy. And at the very basis of this family of phenomenon, we think you have the phenomenon of emotional contagion or mimicry. Now, this is a very simple phenomenon in which you either catch the emotions of others or you start to, to imitate the movements of others without you really realizing that this is not your state. So the classic example is when you have very young babies, they hear other babies cry, they will start to get distressed and they will start to cry themselves. Now we don't think that they're fully aware of the fact that they now cry on behalf of these other children. So it's this very basic phenomenon of emotional contagion. But we think this is really kind of the, the root of the whole family of phenomena. It's where it gets a sap and it's kind of emotional salience. Then on top of that, we have more sophisticated phenomena. One of them is what we normally call empathy proper. Now, empathy proper in our personal terminology, and, and it's just semantics, but and here we assume that people don't just share the state of the other, but they're now aware of the fact that this is not their state. So they feel sad with the other, but they're aware of the fact that this sadness is for the other. That requires a layer of cognitive representation that maybe we do not share with animals. Then the next level is what some people call sympathy, which is now the fact that you no longer feel distressed because the other one is in pain, but you start to get warm feelings that you want to help the person. So to get there, you must have probably had an initial urge of feeling the distress, but then you somehow regulate this to the point where you can now really do something for the other rather than to be overwhelmed by your personal distress. And then at the very end, you really have pro-social behavior, which is you going out to help to alleviate the pain of the other. Now, when we switch to animals, two of these phenomena, uh, which is uh, empathy proper and sympathy, become hard to access because we can't really interrogate our animals and really understand if they understand whose pain this is. But we can have access to two very interesting phenomena, which is prosocial behavior and emotional contagion. So now we can really start to develop at least an animal model of emotional contagion. And one that we found uh, very robust and helpful in this study is the contagion of, um, of fear and distress. So what we do here is we put two rats face to face. One of them is called the demonstrator, the other one is called the witness. Now our witnesses come in two varieties. Half of them never experience an electroshock before. The other half exposed to a mild electroshock. Now this is not really painful, but it, it is scary. I mean, if you know nothing about electricity and you get your first electroshock, it's, uh, it's quite scary. And so what we see in these, uh, in, uh, in rats, when they get scared, is they will freeze. They stop completely to move. And that's a way for us as an observer to really see that that animal is scared in that moment. And then in the main experiment, what we do is we now place them together with another rat. And what we now do is, before anything happens, we just try to monitor how scared the witnesses are by looking at how much they freeze. And at baseline, there's very low levels of freezing, 
independently of whether the rat has or has not experienced electroshocks in the past. But then what we do is we now apply one of these mild electroshocks to the other rat, but we're still interested in seeing what happens in this one. And what we now see is that if the witnesses have never experienced that, that kind of phenomenon before, they show no signs of fear. But if they know what this feels like, then they show very elevated levels of fears, showing that really the emotion of fear that we induced in this demonstrator was carried over to the witness in exactly what we normally call emotional contagion in humans, and in a way that is really incredibly robust. We see it in pretty much all of our animals, and it doesn't even depend on this animal knowing the other one. It works even if they've never met each other before, but it depends on this prior experience. And then something we, we found, which we didn't expect initially, was that how this witness reacts, actually, had quite a strong impact as well on how the demonstrator was experiencing his electroshock himself. So those demonstrators that were paired with naive witnesses that looked unconcerned actually showed, uh, so here you see we administered those ones five of these little shocks, and we measure here now how much the demonstrator is freezing. And what we see is that those that are paired with the naive witnesses only freeze about half as much as the one that are paired with witnesses that become really anxious themselves as well. So here we really see a very unhelpful but very sizable a loop of anxiety here, where the, the shock triggers anxiety of this one. And this can be buffered by a witness that's unconcerned, or it can be augmented by an anxious witness. And I think this really gets back to a discussion that we had before with you, Brian, about how unconstructive it can be, for instance, if in a patient-doctor relationship, the doctor becomes really anxious as well, because that is really something that will kind of loop back and forth and, and create a strong sense of, of anxiety that is shared. And of course, you may ask me, why do rats do that? One option might be to say, well, they live in social groups, empathy is really important for them, and this makes them better group animals, right? If they care about what other animals go through, that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is that maybe what just happens is that for a rat, it's really important to know whether there's danger around. And by kind of exchanging information from one to the other about how scary the situation is, there is a benefit for the individual himself as well because they now collect information about how dangerous this situation is. And we really think that one doesn't exclude the other, right? The selfish motivation of knowing your environment better is not incompatible with the notion of caring for others. But I think what this gives us is the sense that sharing emotions with others is really deeply embedded into our evolution. And it's something that we can probably nurture with some confidence because it is deeply rooted in our brains. But it is experience dependent. Now, you might wonder what happened in the brain of that rat while it experienced the first electroshock. What makes that one experience a potential to empathize with others? And that uh, ties into a much larger question of how is it that humans, for instance, can map the actions of others onto their own actions? Is that pre-wired or can we learn through experience? Now, we thought about this a lot, and we think that there is a very simple explanation to how we can learn to share the emotions and the actions of others. Now, what I'm going to represent here in my brain is uh, what happens in my baby girl while she learns to grasp for the first time. So we imagine that in her brain, when she was born, she has some red neurons in the motor cortex that make her grasp, and some yellow neurons that make her throw things away. Now, imagine she activates the red neurons. So now what she's going to do is she's going to grasp something around her. Now, what we know is that children 
Young babies in particular are fascinated by their own hands. They really spend a lot of the time just staring at these moving hands. So while she's grasping, and this was uh, my baby girl grasping for the second time in her life. I'm not a very good scientist, otherwise I would have had the first time as well. But you see her here staring at her hand while she's grasping this piece of jewelry. Now what that means is that the moment she has her grasping motor program in full gear, she will have visual feedback into her visual cortex, activating neurons that represent those kind of visual stimuli. Now, I believe that in the newborn brain, there's just pretty random connections between vision and action. We know that these connections must exist because we can control our actions by looking at things. But at birth, I don't think that they're in a very specific. But now we have a very interesting situation is that this visual input will reach an active neuron. This visual input will reach a non-active neuron. And we know that there is one fundamental rule of how the brain learns, which is the fact that what fires together wires together, which means that these neurons that fire together because the child sees herself act will wire together the ones that represent irrelevant actions will diswire. What that means is after she has grasped for a hundred or a thousand times, and we know babies are very patient, they'll do this a lot of times, now she has selected the right wiring so that when she now sees me grasp, she'll activate these neurons. But through her own experience, the wiring will now map my grasping onto the neurons that she would use to do the grasping herself. And she can now relate my action to her own, not through pre-wiring or anything, but just by witnessing what her own actions look like. And for emotions, when a baby cries, the baby experiences on distress and experiences what the cry sounds like. So that after doing that a couple of times, while it hears another baby cry, it can now relate through the association of his own experiences. And then when we get to facial expressions, this gets a bit more complicated, right? Because I don't see my own smile while I'm smiling. But whoever has seen a mother with a newborn baby in her hand, the most silly behavior you'll ever see is this mirroring, right? Every facial expression of the baby gets amplified and projected back to the baby, which is adorable to look at and creates this wonderful learning opportunity in the child to really learn to see what his own emotions look like, wiring up this ability now to really map something visual that happens in someone else with his own richness of his inner emotional life. Now, do we have evidence that we can rewire our empathy as adults as well? This was a model in baby. Well, the answer is actually yes. And the way we can look at that in human adults is, of course, not to look at basic facial expressions because we've had all of that life of experience. But we can use the fact that a lot of us have, for instance, never played the piano. So who of you has never played the piano? Okay. So you would be wonderful for this experiment because I could put you in the scanner, play you back a very simple keyboard tune and measure what parts of the brain are active while you listen to them. And if I would do that, I would get activity in these regions here that are your auditory cortex. So that's just a sign to the fact that you're hearing what is happening. Now, this melody is so simple because I can give you five hours of lessons, and at the end of the five hours, you know how to play this keyboard melody. But the interesting thing is that for those five hours, you read, your brain is trained because each time you press a certain key, you hear a certain sound. So this is the kind of Habian learning we need. You're now mapping the sound to the action. And after just five hours, if I make you listen to the same melody in the scanner again, you now will activate representations of your finger actions as if you'd be playing the melody yourself. 
So in five hours, you stop to listen to piano with just your ears, and you start to listen to it with your fingers just because you went through this experience of what the new action sounds like. So I think when we were discussing kind of early intervention, whether we should as well supplement them with the adult, I think this shows us that uh, even old dogs can learn new tricks, and that maybe it's not all foretold once you're an adult. But there is no doubt about the fact that neuroplasticity is strongest in the early ages, and that the efficacy probably of early experiences are stronger. Now we can go back after this little parenthesis to whether this activity really triggers emotional contagion. So in humans, we had identified two regions, the cingulate, which is a core pain area in the insula, as being active whenever you saw the pain of others. Now what we can do in the rat, because the rat actually has a very similar brain, we can go to the same part of the cingulate and inject a drug that will, for a couple of hours, suppress brain activity in that region. And we can now repeat the emotional contagion test we had. And what we see is that animals in which we injected Massimol to suppress um, activity in their own pain regions now will uh, only pick up the emotion of the other half as strongly as animals that have this region intact, really showing the causality in this system. And we also see that the effect is quite specific because you can induce fear in a rat, not through the social channel of seeing another one getting a shock, but by presenting, for instance, a tone that was in the past presented when they got an electroshock. So it is still a memory of their first experience, but it's not a social one. And if we look at this kind of traditional fear conditioning, we see no effect of suppressing their own pain region. So this uh, region is really involved mainly in the social context, where you pick up the emotions of others by looking at their behavior. That's when your own kind of pain network becomes really critical. Now, the next phenomenon we were really interested in is to see whether this would motivate us to help other people. And here we'll go back to human experiments to give you an example of what we've done here in humans. So what we focused on here was the role of the somatosensory cortex. So again, this is the region that's involved when you get touched, for instance, but also while you see someone else get touched. And so what we do in this experiment is we try to create a situation that feels real and that matters. So we would have two people come into the lab and then they would draw lots. One of them draws the, the lot that says victim, and they're kind of the unfortunate one. The other one draws a lot that says uh, decision maker. Now what happens, the decision maker gets uh, to, to, uh, to go with the victim into a room in which we'll uh, basically show them uh, that we have a belt, that we're going to be hitting the victim on the hand in a painful way. How strongly that's going to be is going to be chosen first by the computer, but then later on you can influence how, how strong that pain is going to be in the next trial. And you see that there's a video camera onto the hand of the victim, and you're going to be able to see the things real life from the scanner. Then we bring you to the scanner, you, you get in the scanner so we can measure your brain activity, and you have a screen in which you can see what happens to the victim. And now in every trial what will happen is that you will first see a little movie of the belt hitting the hand with a certain intensity that's chosen by the computer. So in this case, for instance, the movie was suggesting a pain intensity of more or less six out of a pain scale of 10, where 10 is the strongest imaginable pain you could, uh, you could receive. And now you get to take a decision. Because I give you six euros. Now you can, uh, six euros, that's about uh, nine, uh, nine Canadian dollars. Now these are student subjects. For them, that's, uh, no, they go through about 100 trials. There's nine euros involved in um, pretty much each trial, so it matters. But they can now take a decision. They can take the money all back home and do something nice with it, or they can give some of it away 
to reduce the victim's next slap on the hand. So what they can do is uh, uh, the cursor uh, is by default, so let's say on one euro. Now they can slide it down to zero euro. That means they're not going to give every, anything away and they can take it all home. But now the victim will receive the next slap again of intensity six. Or they can give away, for instance, four of these euros and then they know and will witness that the next lap will be in quite painless because now it's six minus four, an intensity of only two. So what we witness here is basically the fact that you have to take a decision between your own financial gains and pain to others. Now what we see is that most people really regulate their donation very finely to how much pain they perceived in the first trial. Whenever the first trial was very you know, painful, they give away a lot of money. When the first trial was not, they give away little money, which is the right thing to do, right? There's no point in giving away a lot of money if the person is not in pain. Then we measured brain activity in their own somatosensory cortex to see whether they just take a rational decision or whether they take an empathetic decision. If it's empathetic, you would assume that their own somatosensory activity should predict how much they're going to give. And that's exactly what we see, basically, when the movie starts, uh, just 500 milliseconds afterwards, we see that activity in your own pain region predict how much you're going to give. And now we can do the really interesting test. We can use TMS again to disturb your empathy and see whether that will change how much money they give away. And what we see is that what that does is that the subject on average actually still gave away the same amount. But what did change is that they were now no longer adapting it to the needs of the other. They were giving away a pretty average amount independently of whether the other one really needed it or not. And this is really the first evidence that by modulating how much the brain will empathize with the pain of the other, you directly influence how much the person will do to help the other person. Now, I hope that by this point, I've shown you that uh, this kind of empathetic activity that all of us in the room, I think, we, we're keen to promote through intervention, really does allow you to perceive better what goes on in others and will change the way that you feel about others and what you will do for them. And now, in the last few minutes, what I'd briefly like to do with you is to tell you a couple of factors that we now know will influence how much you deploy these systems. And because uh, time has flown a bit faster than what I thought, I will just pick two of these examples. Now, the first of them is the in-group, out-group uh, belonging and the sense of fairness. So that is a very elegant experiment that was done by Tanya Zinger. What she did was she invited people in triplets. The first thing they did was they played a kind of trust game where you, could, uh, know, where you could either get a lot of money for yourself or be fair and share it with other people. And of the triplet, one person was incredibly selfish and the other one was nice and fair. Now the interesting thing is the third person in the second part of the experiment gets to witness either the good guy or the bad guy get electroshocks. And this whole thing was done with males watching males and females watching females. Now the interesting thing was if you looked at the female participants, and now we're looking at how much they activate their pain regions, why they see the electroshock administered to the fair player or the unfair player, there was sign of pain activity in both cases. A little bit more for the fair than the unfair player. But when she did the same with male participants, there was just as much empathy as what was true for female participants when a male saw the fair player get pain. So it's not true that we're incapable of empathy. <laughs> but when you look at the unfair player, that's where you see a real gender effect in that the males really did not seem to care very much for that unfair player getting punishment. And there was even a bit of activity in reward centers in that case. Whereas the females in this particular experiment seem to empathize even for the unfair player. And I think this is a, a really interesting phenomenon when we think as well about 
why we associate certain jobs with certain genders, right? For instance, why do we send our men to war more than, uh, than our women? Kind of nowadays, where a lot of it is in a remote controlled drones dropping bombs, there is no physical might argument to choose one gender over the other. But if we see that maybe women would need to suffer a lot more from empathy while punishing the enemy, there would be a good reason to maybe do that choice in a way to minimize the stress in the people that need to do certain jobs. Now, there have been studies looking uh, at uh, race as well. And in this particular study, they were using uh, not fMRI, but a different technique. Uh, I'm not going to go into the technical details. But what you could see is that a white person had more empathy for white hand being pinpricked and a black person for black hand. So that sounds racially in a, in a kind of problematic. But later on, Tanya Zinger again did a similar experiment looking at minimal group. So in Zurich, there's two football teams, and people have very strong opinions about which one is good and which one is bad. So she recruited fans of Team A and fans of Team B. And she basically showed them movies of other people experiencing pain with the added information of, oh, and that person also likes Team A, or, oh, but that person actually likes the other team. And just this label was enough to, to change pain activity from high when they like the same team to low when they like the different team. So that really shows us that by changing this label of we versus them, we, we have a strong handle on how much we're going to empathize. Now I'm going to switch the part on responsibility in the interest of time and conclude by going back to the psychopath that uh, Brian was talking about earlier as well. Because I think they're really interesting. So we got interested in psychopathic criminal because everyone was telling us they're incapable of empathy. They're really cold-hearted. They don't care about what happens to others. So we figured this is really a population in which we can maybe see reduced activity in these systems. So we, in a, we got them out of high security prisons and kind of brought them to our scanning facility. And the, in the first part of the experiment, we let them observe the interactions of two hands. Sometimes the interaction was painful, one hand twisting a finger of the other. Sometimes it was socially excluding. Sometimes it was neutral. And sometimes it was just a tender caress. Now, I guess you can um, guess what's going to come next in the experiment. We let them experience similar emotions. So that was the fun part. Our graduate student could get into the room with these terrible criminals and hit them on the hand to make them experience some pain, to socially exclude them, to touch them, or to caress them. Now, from the second part, we could look at whether there were really differences in the way that they were experiencing their own emotions. And we saw no difference at all there. So they were activating the same emotional somatosensory and motor region while experiencing these states than our controls would. But we did see differences while they were simply observing the states of others. Well, we saw that healthy volunteers had strong activity in somatosensory motor and emotional region whenever they were observing these states of others. The psychopath had much weaker activity, in particular in these emotional regions. So that led us first to a very simple interpretation that indeed they have a broken empathy. They just can't empathize with the sensations and emotions of others. But then my wife had the idea, well, wait a second. Why don't we scan them again? But this time we asked them to try and empathize with the victims. And what we saw was that this simple instruction eradicated all the differences in the brain activity between the two groups. So what that showed us was it's not the case that they're incapable of activating the states that other people go through. It just looks like they don't normally use this capacity unless they have a reason to do so. And I think that really opened our eyes to think of empathy again. So when we started, we thought of this as a kind of one-dimensional 
thing where some people are high on empathy, some people are low on empathy. And we thought the psychopaths were low, we have some people in the middle, and then we have these extremely empathic people that Brian talked about as well at the very high end. But now by seeing that a psychopath can switch from low to high empathy, we have to really rethink this as being at least two-dimensional. We have the ability to empathize when you want to on the one dimension, and then we have the propensity to empathize when you have no reason to empathize on the other side. And then we get to a more interesting situation where maybe some people that we call the really empathic one really stand out not just because they can empathize very well, but because they'll always empathize. They're the ones that will look away when there's a violent scene in a movie because if they don't look away, they will be overwhelmed. And then we have the other people that are just as able to empathize. Maybe when they want to be Machiavellian, when they want to understand what goes on in the woman to get her into the deep uh, dark alley, then they turn on this capacity and they get all the good information you can get from empathy. But then once they are in the dark alley and they want to get sexual satisfaction, then they're not bound to feel the distress and terror of the victim. And therefore, they are then driven by other goals, and they're unrestrained by their empathy. So I think really thinking of these two dimensions and how interventions, for instance, act more on the ability or the propensity is, I think, something that we start to get interested in. And where autism, for instance, would map out on this two-dimensional space is something that still hasn't been looked at very much and how we, we should really gear our therapies there becomes really interesting because there are lots of interventions with psychopathic criminals in prisons that try to teach them empathy, and a lot of them have not really reduced uh, their relapse. But if we see that they maybe were already able to empathize, we maybe understand why. What we really need to work on is how to make them empathize all the time. But unfortunately, I don't quite know how to do that. So now to conclude, what we've seen is that while we empathize with this Syrian boy, what really happens is that our brain immerses us in the kind of states that we would be in if we were in that situation. And that's an important point because it's not the state that the boy is in. These are the states that we would be in if we were in that situation, because we learn them through our own experiences. So if we're very similar to the other, there will be very deep insights. But if we had very different experiences, they can leave us astray as well. But if we put all of them together, we can really get deep insights in others, and it will influence our behavior. But what we do see as well is that we have certain controls over how much we'll empathize in a certain situation. If we perceive the other one as unfair, we're going to downregulate this. If we perceive him as very fair or the in-group, we're going to empathize more. The psychopath really shows how some of us are incredibly good at down and up regulating it. But I think we should take home from that the fact that empathy is not just a gift, but it is as well a responsibility and a decision. In every situation we're in, we can decide to some extent how much we will be empathizing. And this is something we should really think about, this responsibility for ourselves and to teach this responsibility to others. And now I'd just like to conclude by thanking all the wonderful people that have made that possible. And I think above and foremost, my wife, Valeria Gazzola, with whom I've done pretty much all the research that I've presented to you today. And it is incredibly important to, when you do research, to have one person that can really tell you in your face that what you're saying is complete nonsense. And that's what my wife is good for. Then there's a lot of really good postdocs and PhD students that give decades of their lives to, to generating that knowledge. And I'm incredibly indebted to them. And then some of my mentors, Giacomo Rizzolatti and Vittorio Galese, who observed mirror neurons for the first time, really influenced my thinking enormously. 
these funders that believe that this kind of research is important, and I'm incredibly thankful to them. I'm incredibly thankful for you to listen and for you to really transform what we know about empathy into a better world. And I thank you. Thank you.